welcome everybody. My name is Jens Hilke. I'm a conservation planner with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and today we're here to talk about better zoning to prevent forest fragmentation. Uh, the main speaker for today's webinar is Darren Schibler from uh, the senior planner at uh, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. Uh, I'm gonna do the first little segment uh, just to set the stage, uh, talk a little bit more about forest fragmentation, and then we will turn this over to Darren. Um, all right. So, um, first of all, you've passed the test uh, and, and successfully logged into Teams. I, I know it's a fickle beast, uh, but thanks for sticking with it. Um, go ahead and unmute, excuse me, go ahead and mute your microphones and, and turn off your video. Um, and uh, please do use the chat. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions during the presentation. We're gonna take a break about every 10 or 15 slides. And uh, on the back end, uh, forgive me, I forgot to mention, uh, Dave Maroney is with us and he's managing the back end. And uh, so every 10 to 15 slides will stop. Uh, Dave will read the questions in the chat uh, and, uh, and, and, and we'll be able to address them at that time. So for now, to practice using the chat, if you would please uh, type in your name and uh, what town you're in or uh, organization, a town board that you serve on, uh, that would be great just to give us a sense of who all is here. Uh, and, and here we go. So uh, first of all, I want to begin by, by setting the stage about uh, forest fragmentation. And then we're going to hand this over to, to Darren to talk more about the importance of planning and how zoning does or, or doesn't uh, prevent forest fragmentation. Then he'll talk about tools for planning compact, walkable neighborhoods in town centers and offer some tips, uh, some zoning tips to prevent forest fragmentation. Uh, and then here's what our, our break and questions uh, section uh, is, is going to look like. So just to give you a sense. Before I get too far along, I'll just remind you all that, that Dave and I are with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and we believe in the conservation of fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the people of Vermont. That's a huge mission. It takes us in a lot of different directions. Our part of it is uh, we staff the Community Wildlife Program, and so we offer technical assistance to all Vermont municipalities and regional planning commissions, we work very closely with the RPCs. Our job is to provide the science and interpret it uh, and, and, and scale it to the appropriate size and really make it available for your work in planning and, and to help the RPCs uh, work with the towns to develop good town plan language, zoning bylaws, subdivision, et cetera. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact us uh, at the Community Wildlife Program for, for help uh, in what you're engaged in, in in your town. Okay, so let's just set the stage here. The, in, in our communities, we get exponentially more benefits from larger forest blocks than we do from smaller forest blocks. There's a whole range of benefits from street trees to huge uh, to huge forest blocks, but we do get more benefits with the larger blocks. They're providing land for for the working uh, for working land, like for the forest industry. We get economic benefits of recreation and tourism. We get ecological benefits. They prevent erosion. They reduce flooding. Uh, they sequester carbon, and we get more biological diversity in larger forest blocks than we do in smaller. When you compare them at the the town scale. So just as a starting point, understanding that we want our, our blocks intact, connected, and diverse. That's the goal here of, of maintaining our, our largest forest blocks. But when they, get, when they get carved up, when we get forest fragmentation, we impact human health. Um, the uh, the for practicing forestry becomes operationally impractical. Uh, the the we degrade the recreational experience. We there's there's less soil infiltration and water filtration, and we get more water moving faster over the surface. Uh, we when we chop up our blocks into smaller and smaller chunks, we release carbon that are stored in the soils and vegetation, and we reduce the capacity to sequester uh, carbon. Uh, 
Um, we get increased mortality from vehicle collisions, uh, wildlife vehicle collisions, because wildlife have to use multiple blocks to get what they need. And so there are more road crossings, so there's more risk of, of collision. Um, of course, I, as I mentioned at the, at the outset, we are reducing the human health benefits from forests. And I think we're losing something of that rural character, that rural nature. So there's this whole uh, focus on just maintaining forests as intact, connected, and diverse, and, and minimizing these effects of, of forest fragmentation. On the, the continental scale, wildlife are on the move in response to a changing climate. What you see on screen is a, a projection from the Nature Conservancy of some 2,000 species of mammals, birds, amphibians, and how they are going to move and are moving to adjust their range in the face of a changing climate. The Nature Conservancy estimates that entire populations are moving north and south away from the equator on average about 11 miles per decade, about a mile per year. That's entire populations. And so the, the pathways that these species are using are overwhelmingly forested connections. So that pattern of how our forests line up uh, matters a great deal to, to allow for, for this wildlife on the move. In Vermont, we have the Vermont Conservation Design uh, available to you on the BioFinder website. And so we can get a sense at, at the Vermont scale of where exactly these species are moving. What are the highways of, of wildlife movement in response to this changing climate? As many of you well know, the actual pattern of wildlife movement is more complex than that. And there's quite a bit of local wildlife movement. And so the actual network of wildlife movement across the state uh, involves hundreds of much smaller local level connections. And so I'm just trying to give you a sense of why this pattern of intact, connected, and diverse forests matters so much uh, as we think about climate change. But with climate change, we're also getting people on the move. Uh, and uh, this is a, a slide of the, the out of sales to out-of-state buyers uh, between 20, uh, 2020 and 2021. And we see an increase of about 1,000 residential property units. Um, about a 38% increase. And so if, if we don't have uh, solid, uh, solid regulations at the town level, then we're leaving it to others to determine what our pattern looks like, lose the ability to control that pattern. Uh, and so the problem isn't that we have people moving to Vermont. The problem is that we're, we're not controlling the pattern of where we want those people to move to. So let me just illustrate the, the basic pattern that I'm talking about here. Uh, this is a picture from Rutland County. So these are the largest forest blocks in the town, core forest, huge. They, they anchor the entire network. These are the largest ones. And so as we think about Act 171, the Forest Integrity Bill, uh, information you might want to put in your town plan, well, these are, are, are certainly the, the starting point for that. Include those core forest blocks uh, in, your, in your planning. But then there are a set of forest blocks that are smaller that because of their location are critically important stepping stones. And so this block in the middle, you can't get from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen without using this block. So even though it's smaller, its landscape context makes it indispensable. So include those in your planning work as you think about this mix of forest blocks and connectors. And then let's think about micro connectors. Uh, these are wildlife road crossings. Um, so there's trees on both sides of the road that connect the blocks, the larger blocks. And so these are where the vast majority of wildlife species are going to be crossing the road. So that's a type of connector that you wanna include in your, in your planning and regulatory framework. And of course, there's the streamside network. Uh, so the streamside vegetation. So that riparian network uh, of all of the, the streams and rivers, that's incredibly important, again, for knitting together those blocks, particularly in the valleys at lower elevations 
those uh, that network of, of streams and rivers is hugely important for this overall pattern of connectivity. So we're looking at that pattern of, of connected forests, but we're also understanding that it's the, the streamside vegetation that, that is one of the, the, the connectors uh, involved in this larger pattern. So that was a hugely quick uh, introduction to forest fragmentation. We have a lot more resources on our website about uh, the, these concepts, but I just wanted to make as much room uh, for Darren to, to really jump into the, the heart of the issue. Dave, uh, as, as Darren's transitioning, Dave, are there any questions for me at this time? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, Joe has asked what species are heading north that aren't here already, if you happen to have any examples um, top of mind. Yeah, uh, tulip tree, <laughs> uh, Liriodendron tulipifera. It's, uh, it's in extreme southern Vermont, and we actually consider it a rare species. But it's it's a, a typical cove hardwood uh, in in the central Appalachians, and it's headed our way. Or black gum, Nyssa sylvatica. That's another one. Uh, and so those are uh, those are trees headed our headed our way. Mountain laurel, uh, neat shrub, is headed our way. Uh, so it's not all bad news, doom and gloom. There are also some really fun plants that are that are heading this way. Yeah. Are there any? Sense. What about animals? Are there any animals? That are uh, that, like possum. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say a possum. I mean, they've already they've they've already come up. Uh, you know, the turkey vulture was uh, came in with the with the creation of the highway. Uh, we before we had large scale roadkill, we didn't have vultures, and and now we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are yeah, just a few examples. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. You know, I'll just add that the the other component of this. Uh, movement is that species that are here that are common are also going to be continuing to move north. So our moose population we're going to be losing um, over time and some of our, our boreal forest um, affiliate species like potentially the marten um, and, and others. Thanks. Um, Darren, uh, feel free to share your screen. I'll do that in a second. Before I do, I'm just going to sort of give a bit of an intro to CCRPC. As Jens mentioned, we are a regional planning commission, and like a uh, community wildlife program, we our role is to support municipalities in doing their planning, zoning, uh, you know, capital improvement work. Um, and so a lot of what we're talking about today um, is, you know, we also do natural resources work, but we kind of come at it from a different angle. So I'm going to share my screen and show you uh, a little bit of sort of what we typically uh, think about in um, the planning world is, you know, thinking about density and compact walkable neighborhoods. So this slide shows some of the uh, benefits of uh, compact walkable neighborhoods and compact development as opposed to the uh, drawbacks of low density sprawl development. Uh, and, you know, in addition to, you know, energy efficiency and allowing for less driving, more walking and biking, you'll see that we have, um, you know, these benefits of increasing uh, natural habitat, so carbon sequestration, carbon storage, uh, stormwater control, you name it. We've got so much uh, reason to conserve um, land and to minimize our development's uh, geography, minimize our, um, you know, impact on the landscape. Uh, so just sort of to provide that 10,000 foot view of why we do this and how you know these uh, goal of preventing forest fragmentation is also really important for our human society and our human environment to uh, meet our needs. Um, and as Jens mentioned, you know there's a pattern to uh, the landscape and there's also a pattern to the human landscape. Um, and that is generally in our human you know society and our development scheme is defined by planning and zoning. Uh, we have land use plans that say here's roughly where we want to put all of our homes and businesses and utilities and roads. Uh, and then there's zoning that says here are the rules for how to do that. And generally our goal in Vermont has always been to uh, have compact clustered development, small uh, villages surrounded by open countryside. That's in our planning statutes and goals. So, you know, in comparison to this, you know, sort of uh, development pattern where everyone gets a little slice of paradise and can clear for their 
uh, house site and have have a nice long driveway, we actually really would prefer to have folks be a little closer together, be better neighbors, and uh, have a minimal impact on the landscape. So that's a lot of what our planning work tries to encourage is uh, this compact clustered development surrounded by open countryside. And as we know, that'll protect forests, wildlife habitat, uh, river corridors, and our uh, riparian areas as well. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, you know, planning is sort of the bigger picture, you know, putting things on uh, a broad um, scale piece of paper, looking at that big forested landscape and the how humans fit into it. Uh, and it's a little more aspirational, a little more, you know, uh, conceptual. But when we come down to brass tacks, you know, we're talking about zoning, which is a set of rules that uh, dictate how land development can happen. You might also hear zoning regulations referred to as zoning bylaws, zoning ordinance, or zoning codes, potentially, or land use codes. All of these pretty much mean the same thing, and I might use them interchangeably. Um, but uh, some common elements of zoning when we're thinking about rural areas and forested areas uh, include what I've shown on the screen here. Um, the oldest sort of uh, approach to zoning is to have uh, separation of uses and separation of uh, planning areas. So you'd have a you know, development area and then a forestry conservation area uh, or district uh, where you'd say this is a different type of development pattern allowed here. So that could include large lot sizes and a limited number of uses, uh, pretty much just single unit homes or, you know, small scale residential farms, forestry operations and anything sort of uh, supporting that rural uh, economy. Um, as zoning has um, been around for a little while, we've gotten a little more sophisticated and introduced things like overlay districts. So that's saying that in addition to that base zoning of forestry conservation versus, you know, rural, residential, and, uh, you know, downtown, we have another set of rules that apply specifically based on the types of resources that are present in any of those districts. So your stream will run through all of those districts and you'd want to have uh, standards specific to that stream area rather than just, you know, carving that up into its own zoning district because it'll vary based on, you know, the context of an urban or rural space. Um, Something else that folks don't necessarily think about as a tool to uh, talk about uh, restricting or preventing forest fragmentation in your zoning is something uh, called the driveway or access standard, which you can use to limit the length of driveways and the number of dwellings on a particular driveway or encourage more dwellings on a driveway. Um, you can require shared access and avoid uh, certain types of resources that should be protected. Uh, and those are actually critically important when it comes to preventing fragmentation because um, those can really disrupt wildlife uh, patterns. Uh, and then one another sort of more sophisticated approach to zoning is something called a conservation subdivision. Uh, so zoning is often includes rules about how you subdivide land and parcels into different ownership. Um, and you may have a whole separate uh, set of rules for that, or it might be part of your zoning. Um, but typically that also is important in defining the pattern of land use because it's usually uh, dictating where you can put how many, a certain number of dwellings and how they're sort of arranged to each other. So that's basic subdivision. A conservation subdivision takes the approach of saying, hey, there are resources we want to protect, and we'd like you to design your subdivision and your parcel layout to be respective of that. So you might require a certain percentage of the parcel being subdivided to be conserved. You might require them to be clustered and some of the, the development parcels to be smaller. You might require specific building envelopes that dictate where the homes can go on those parcels, uh, not just, you know, uh, anywhere on the land. Um, so those are some of the tools that we've used over time to uh, get at these issues. Uh, and the image you see on the screen is a zoning map for the town of Montgomery, and it shows not all of these elements, uh, but a lot of them. You can see there's forest conservation districts, village districts, river corridors, and flood hazard overlays. Uh, it shows the roads, et cetera. Um, so these are you know, very common, and, and almost every town in Vermont has zoning, but not every town does. So based on this scheme that we've developed for how we regulate land use, uh, it seems like we've got a lot of good tools. We've got some pretty good sense of how things should work. So the question is, how are we doing? 
Uh, well, uh, our friends at Vermont Natural Resources Council uh, have done some uh, research on this and looked at the subdivision of land, specifically uh, the parcel size, and they used uh, grand list data from your assessor's offices to figure this out. Uh, and there are some caveats associated with this data, but what we're seeing in trends here uh, is that the parcel size in Vermont, on average, has been uh, decreasing. So there we have more parcels that are smaller on this left side of the screen, and the number of larger parcels on the right side of the screen has mostly gone down, although we have a few really large parcels that have kind of consolidated over the years. Um, so that's not necessarily a problem. You know, parcelization doesn't necessarily indicate forest fragmentation. It just means that the ownership of land has been changed. Uh, but when you also look at uh, the use of all those parcels uh, in terms of the acreage, more of our acreage in the state has become residential in nature. That may just be one house that may be, you know, good clustered development, or it might be, you know, someone's put their driveway 5,000 or 1,000 feet into the woods and their cabin up on the top of the hill. Um, it could be anything, but we're seeing a lot more parcels having housing on them. Fewer farms, fewer parcels that are purely woodland. Uh, and with those two trends combined, it seems pretty clear that uh, a lot more subdivision is happening. A lot more of our land is being used for these residential purposes. Um, and, you know, again, this is not the only piece of evidence we'd use to make that conclusion because there's uh, differences in how that is uh, categorized over different towns. Um, and those farm parcels uh, may also include some residential, but overall, these are the trends we're seeing, um, and it's a little concerning. And part of the reason for this, uh, we think, at least at the planning um, community, is that uh, we aren't necessarily clear about what we want in our regulations. We say we want these, you know, um, uh, clustered villages surrounded by open countryside, but then in our rules, we actually don't encourage that very effectively. Um, you know, we require setbacks uh, between buildings saying, you know, you need to have at least 20 or more feet of space between each building and they need to be set uh, 40 feet back from the road. Well, there's limits to how much clustering you can achieve with those setbacks. Um, we might require large tracts of open space, but often those are split up over a bunch of different parcels, which makes it difficult to uh, have those open spaces be managed effectively. We also tend to require a lot of parking because we live in a very auto-oriented society and uh, it seems like a very important issue for a lot of folks, and it is, but uh, sometimes we maybe require too much parking and we don't consider the context of when less parking might be appropriate, such as in our compact centers where we can have transit and walking and biking. Um, some other things that maybe are a little more subtle are saying, you know, we want low impact development, we want uh, less impervious area, and we want, uh, you know, green stormwater infrastructure, um, or we might want, you know, development to provide some of the, um, you know, sidewalks and utilities and other things that we need to support them. Uh, but really, a lot of times what we end up doing in zoning is saying, you don't actually have to provide that, just pay to offset your impacts and the town will take care of doing that, which is great if the town has done that, but it doesn't create the responsibility at each development scale to sort of think about these issues. Um, you know, there's good pros and cons to impact fees, but uh, over the large scale, sometimes we see some, uh, you know, trends that don't help us. And really, we've made zoning very complicated. Uh, most zoning codes are at least 100 pages long. Some are several hundred pages long, and there's so many different rules and ways that things interact that it makes it hard to make a good project uh, that can meet all these rules and get through the process without costing a fortune. Uh, and also, the more dense your project is, the more complicated it is, and the less certainty you get. And so the result is that the type of development we've encouraged is what you see on the bottom of the screen. We encourage a lot of, uh, you know, simple uh, subdivision where every uh, lot has one house. We've run a road through here uh, and everyone gets their little piece of uh, open space or their yard. And that's what we've really encouraged uh, and made easy. So we'd really like to change that trend. Um, so how do we do that? The one takeaway I hope you get from this presentation is that uh, the best thing you can do to prevent forest fragmentation 
is to plan compact walkable centers in your neighborhoods and your town centers. So for, you know, as important as conservation zoning is and as important as it is to regulate what's going on in those rural areas, this is what's going to be the biggest bang for your buck. If you uh, direct your development to these areas that are already impacted and already planned for growth, uh, you're going to have less impact on those rural areas. Like Yen said, you know, the problem isn't the number of people coming to Vermont or the number of people who are, you know, looking for homes and places to be. It's the pattern of where we're telling them they should go. Um, so examples of what that means, we want to encourage density in those areas planned for growth. We don't want to make it hard to do that. We want to re maybe remove minimum lot sizes and maximum density requirements. We want to lower or remove parking minimums and plan for infrastructure uh, to make sure that we can support those things, uh, you know, those dense areas with the, um, the resources they need. You might want to even plan uh, an official map for your public facilities by saying, here's where we're going to put things and we're, here's where the housing is going to go around it and the businesses that support that. Um, and that may include having a defined area for your uh, utilities, your water, your sewer, if you have a stormwater utility, because that can really limit uh, how much, you know, where folks are looking to invest in development and say, you know, we're going to put it all here. We're not going to serve you if you're outside that area. You're kind of on your own. Um, so it makes it easy for folks to make the right decision. Um, and then again, funding that infrastructure is the really challenging thing in this uh, you know, world of increasing inflation. But doing that at your municipal level really makes a difference. Um, other things you might not think about, allowing for multiple principal structures on a lot. What do I mean by that? Uh, you can have a single, single unit home on any lot in Vermont, um, but you could also allow an accessory business or you are required to allow an accessory apartment if someone wants to do that. You could even allow a second uh, single unit home if someone wants to have their um, you know, uh, grandparent move in or their grand um, child move in or an in-home caregiver. Uh, allowing the flexibility in these areas planned for growth, especially in these urban compact centers, really makes it easy for folks to um, meet their needs without having to go further out where the rules are maybe a little less restrictive. Um, and again, promoting those mixed uses in those compact, uh, sorry, those vibrant, uh, you know, centers where people want to be and want to get all their needs met. Um, and the last takeaway for compact center uh, zoning is make your process simple and easy and predictable. Use an administrative review process as much as possible rather than having every application go to your uh, zoning board or your uh, development review board for uh, you know, public hearing review. If folks can get things permitted quickly and predictably, they're, they're going to spend less time uh, and money having to sort of deal with uncertainty, uh, and that's going to make for cheaper and more affordable and better quality um, development in your areas where you want that to happen. Um, and another thing we see a lot is uh, a lot of the um, traditional villages that we really value as Vermonters are not enabled in current zoning. You couldn't build, uh, you know, uh, certain villages today under the current rules. So trying to uh, amend your rules to allow that pattern to happen rather than the pattern we've been seeing. Um, an example of this, and I'm going to apologize for the Chittenden County centric example because that's what we what I'm uh, familiar with, but Wright Avenue in Williston, this is uh, kind of in the big box store section of Williston in Taft's Corners. Uh, this is behind uh, Route 2 and the uh, former Vermont uh, uh, pizza, the, um, pizza place uh, and the um, near the Hannaford. Uh, so this is sort of the type of development we tend to encourage over the last uh, 30 to 50 years. Wide streets, uh, buildings set back. We've got some sidewalks, but no one's using them because there's nothing here to you know, walk to. What we'd like to see is uh, what the My Taft Corners uh, plan for 2050 is uh, envisioning, which is a lot more density, which means more stuff to, for people to uh, come and see and visit. Uh, a lot of housing included in those mixed use buildings on the upper floors. Um, and then a little more on-street parking, shared bike lanes, uh, a little more streetscape improvement, but you still can see some of the buildings uh, like the CVS on the left here. Um, it's still there. We can sort of retrofit that. So that's sort of what we're going for. Uh, but I've spent a lot of time talking about 
how we plan in our village centers. And I think you folks are probably interested more in what's going to happen outside those uh, compact centers. And that's the next uh, section, but we're going to stop and ask questions uh, at this point. Great. OK, Darren, we have a number of questions. Um, so just noting time, if there's something that you know will be addressed by the next section, you know, feel free to, um, mm -hmm. to, to take a pause on that. Um, I'm going to try to take one question from each um, each person who's asked one and, and we'll see what we have time for. So again, um, let me know when when if we if we reach a, a point where we should move on. Um, OK, so uh, first of all, from Ellen, um, how can towns control development along class four roads in town trails? That is a great question and uh, probably more than we have a bigger question than we have time to address today. But towns do have control over class four roads. Um, those are roads that are a lower level of maintenance than your um, typical, you know, paved class one highways or state highways um, and may still be owned by the town and may allow for development uh, and, you know, residential development. But, um, you know, one thing you can do is say uh, that there's shared maintenance uh, for the folks that are along that road. Uh, they have to contribute to that. Um, that's typically how it works. Uh, and really sort of not encouraging further development, not uh, investing in maintaining those roads if they're in inappropriate places for growth. If they're in a planned area for growth, that's great, although that's unlikely. Um, and sort of just, you know, we'll talk a little bit about some of the more broader zoning strategies um, that will probably make development on a class four road infeasible. Great, thank you. Um, I'm noting that Jane's question was crowdsourced by Jamie. So Jane, if you still have a, a additional question of that, uh, let us know. Um, so I'm going to go to Diane, uh, who has asked, what if you try hard to protect um, ag land, for example, but someone wants to build a house right in the center of an ag block? Planning says no, but they get a state variance. Yeah, it's a good question. So agriculture is something that uh, is not uh, allowed to be regulated by zoning in Vermont. There's a specific exemption for it. It is, however, regulated fairly carefully by the state in terms of the uh, environmental impacts, the stormwater, the you know um, uh, nutrient pollution, and uh, the sort of impacts to neighbors. Um, so, if someone is doing traditional ag, traditional agriculture, or, or sorry. Uh, you know, agriculture that is meeting that state definition, uh, I'd say, great, let them do that. Uh, let them do what they need to do to keep that land as open as possible. Uh, they may have a building in the middle of the parcel. Maybe that's not ideal. Um, but ultimately, keeping land in agriculture and forestry, which is also regulated by the state and can't be regulated directly by zoning, uh, those are really important conservation strategies, uh, keeping that land viable so that it doesn't get subdivided and turned into residential development because the uh, landowner couldn't make Make ends meet with you know the business they were working in and decided that they had to sell in order to um, be vi financially viable. Um, but uh, in terms of something that is not exactly agriculture, but maybe an accessory on-farm business or a non-farm use of a parcel, um, there are strategies you can use to regulate that. Uh, and we'll talk about those, um, typically clustering and um, uh, identifying the resources that you want to protect and um, requiring the development to avoid those. Great, thank you. So um, I'm going to do one more question from Bridget and then Ellen, I see your other questions. We'll, we'll see if we can circle back to those and if we have time. Um, so Bridget asks, uh, dense cluster development certainly makes sense in theory for town centers in Vermont. Um, but do you have suggestions for when small town pro development planners and development review boards are seem to be disingenuous about des um, designating village center zoning in areas that up until very recently zoned rural residential um, and don't currently have the infrastructure for high density development? That is a, a complicated and loaded question, Bridget, and I I hear the concern there about uh, expanding your development centers into areas that previously were considered rural. Um, and that's why we really are trying to encourage infill development and not expanding those centers as much as possible. Uh, building up rather than out is really what we're going for. However, depending on where your village was located, it may not have good uh, septic capacity. You know, say you want to do shared community wastewater, which is crucial to having dense development, but your soils are just terrible and it just happens to be where the historic village was located. Um, you know, you might have to move a little further out to get the dense development um, 
pattern you need based on the soils or based on uh, natural resource constraints. A lot of our villages also are located in river corridors, and that's not great either because they're going to keep getting flooded and washed out, and they're impacting natural resources uh, through, you know, constraining the river. So it's a very complicated issue, and it's uh, case by case. Um, but I would say, um, you know, in terms of when folks are really looking to do that village center designation and really trying to plan for that compact center, um, I hope that they wouldn't be disingenuous, and I hope that they are looking for uh, what's going to be best for the community to support that overall goal. And they are required to follow those state planning goals uh, that include um, conserving our open spaces and uh, encouraging that compact development. They may just not have another option. Thank you so much. Um, Jens, just doing a time check, I'm wondering if we should move to the next section or continue taking questions. Yeah, Darren, go ahead. Thanks. OK, cool. Hopefully we'll have time to circle back. Yeah. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some case studies, examples of where towns have done a good job, in my opinion, uh, uh, preventing forest fragmentation through their zoning. Uh, and at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about some nitty gritty tips that you might want to check out. But uh, one great example, again from Chittenden County, but a good sort of um, process was the Jericho Natural Resources Overlay District. This was based on a natural resource inventory uh, through a natural heritage uh, element assessment. Uh, it was actually multiple towns collaborating on this assessment. Um, they identified their important resources and then figured out how do we want to protect them. Uh, what I don't talk about here is that they included all this in their town plan, and then which then enables you to adopt zoning that says specifically what you want to do. So what they did was identify these primary and secondary conservation areas, similar to BioFinder. It's a highest priority and then priority uh, forest blocks, uh, riparian habitats, unique uh, physical landscapes, et cetera, and said, these are the places we want to protect. And then based on that, we're going to uh, give you some rules about what you can and can't do in those areas. Most of those primary conservation areas are no go, like don't touch them, uh, limit your impact as much as possible, maybe allow for some working lands, uh, forestry, silviculture, and farming, but really try to make sure that the resources that are there can stay there and are not impacted negatively. And the process for doing that is a uh, zoning application, whether it's a permit or a conditional use review, which is a type of review that goes to your development review board or zoning board, um, which is made up of citizens of your community, and they assess whether the application meets the merits of your um, zoning and your rules. Um, so examples of what they require more in the secondary conservation areas than the primary are minimizing intrusions, uh, creating building envelopes, saying here's the limited area of development that's allowed, even though your parcel includes a larger area and more of these resources. Um, it may include um, having shared accesses and driveways, uh, requiring low impact development practices, uh, minimizing your impervious area and your, so your need for stormwater treatment, uh, and maybe even maintaining and restoring some habitat. Um, there might also be, depending on the resources present, a requirement for a natural resources impact study. Uh, we can't capture everything in one map for the entire town. So uh, if a resource is identified on this map uh, and you may be impacting it, they might um, require you to do a specific, hire a consultant essentially to specifically look at that development and how it might impact a vernal pool or a forest block or a riparian buffer. Um, so this is you know, fairly sophisticated uh, in terms of administering this process, but uh, definitely based on really good science, based on a clear identification of the resources you want to protect and the uh, trade-offs for, you know, if you want to do development, here are the rules you have to follow, uh, and here are sort of the alternatives that we provide you to meet our goals. Um, so I'll move on to another example. Um, in Heinsberg. Uh, this is actually a fairly simple concept. Um, the idea is that an, in most zoning in Vermont, uh, there is an implied rule that your lot size determines your density. The number of homes you can build is based on, or the number of uh, buildings you can build is based on the size of your lot. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can have a lot that is, uh, a, you know, when you're starting out, let's say 10 acres, um, and if your zoning says it's a one acre per um, uh, one acre per lot, 
uh, one would think, okay, well, one acre per lot, I can do one house on each of those lots, I got 10 lot or 10 uh, houses. Well, <clears throat> that makes some sense, but you don't necessarily have to split up that 10 acres into one acre lots under Heinsberg zoning. You can have a three acre lot uh, that's your development area and leave seven acres undeveloped and have smaller house lots that um, are actually more compact, more um, you know, com uh, clustered. They're probably cheaper to build because you only have a short driveway. Uh, you're also avoiding all of these impacts that are not only you know important to avoid and conserve, but also expensive to build around. Um, so here is sort of what that might look like. You've got a couple lots that are smaller here. You might also use building envelopes. It's a similar process. Uh, so they're using a fairly small area of this whole uh, original lot to build, but leaving most of it conserved. Uh, this applies in Heinsberg to their agriculture and rural residential two districts, so um, rural areas. Uh, the other thing is the density in Heinsberg in these areas is determined by the road type, the class of road and the amount of access that it can uh, accommodate and, and the traffic it can accommodate. So that ranges from 10 to 15 acres if it's a for instance, class four road, it's not a class four in Heinsberg, but if it was like that, um, you would say fewer lots, fewer units, uh, lower density. Um, but each of these lots um, in the image here could be as small as five acres, or sorry, as small as 0 0.5 acres, half an acre, rather than a one acre each. Um, so that's another really good simple tool to just disconnect uh, lot size from density and really encourage that compact development. <clears throat> Moving on to another example, uh, Marshfield. Uh, this is again sort of fairly straightforward. Uh, the town of Marshfield has a forestry conservation district that covers a majority of the town and says, you know, we have some really valuable resources here because of where we are in the spine of the greens. We've got a state forest that has a lot of uh, important resources and a lot of conserved land around that. Let's just say we're going to keep it that way. We're going to not allow high density development in a majority of this area. We are going to allow high density development in two of our village center areas, uh, one up here and one more in the south. And we do have some amount of agricultural and rural residential to support those village centers, allow for folks to um, have local food and you know, acknowledge that we can't fit everything in that small area. But really, the majority is uh, 10 acre uh, lots uh, and 10 acres per unit. However, like Heinsberg, they also allow for smaller development lots when you're going to build a house. Uh, so you can actually subdivide as small as two acres out of your 10 acre lot, um, as long as you're doing just that one house. Uh, you might even get a density bonus if you are doing a smaller lot and say, sure, we'll allow you to build even closer together so that we can conserve more of that open space and forest. Um, and another again, simple, but maybe a politically difficult thing to get your town to do um, is to say uh, the open space requirement when you subdivide and develop is half of the lot. You got to keep that open. Uh, you can uh, do whatever you want on that other 50% um, within some rules, but we're going to say, you know, we need half of that to be open and meet in order to meet our town's goals. Our last case study um, is an Enosburg town. Uh, and I actually realized I, I think the H doesn't belong there in Enosburg. Uh, I, I can't remember which one, whether the village or town is uh, an H. But anyway, the point here is uh, limit your uh, length of driveways in your um, zoning standards. The town of Enosburg has fairly simple zoning, fairly, you know, basic. Uh, it's not, you know, hundreds of pages long. It doesn't have a lot of different zip districts and overlays. But what they do say is in our rural residential areas and our conservation zones, we're not going to allow you to go more than 800 uh, feet long for your driveway. Um, we may allow some flexibility in that rural residential as long as it's not impacting anything. Uh, but really, we're trying to say, um, rather than having here on Raven Ridge on the southwest side of the um, uh, image here, this fairly long driveway over a thousand uh, feet, uh, which is going into this purple area, which is the BioFinder core forest block, you know, that makes a major impact. Um, and those houses really could be clustered closer together. Um, and then in comparison, up in the north, or, or sorry, the top left part of the screen on this Pleasant View Drive and Pearly Road addresses, uh, those limited driveway, limited length driveways have made a less uh, severe impact on this forest block. Um, and these are actually in different zoning districts. So you can see very clearly how that makes a difference. 
um, and even shorter driveways, which are probably historically, uh, you know, this way, not, you know, uh, built under this zoning, um, can be even less impactful. So this is a very simple tool. Um, and it also is uh, helpful for the developer or the landowner because then they don't have to plow as much. They don't have to maintain as much and don't have to build as much. So uh, great ideas. Last one, I'll, uh, last couple slides here. Uh, there's a lot of information on this one. I don't need to go through all of it because there's a lot of details, but just wanted to share this um, for future reference. Um, and again, we're going to talk about some big themes here. Zoning tips to prevent forest fragmentation outside your area's plan for growth in your rural areas. Um, the big one is clearly define the resources you want to protect. Work with uh, BioFinder. Find those core forest areas that you want to identify. Find those habitat connectors that are important and put them on a map and say, these are protected and here's why. It's in order to meet our goals under uh, Act 171, which is important for forest conservation. Uh, and um, here's how we're going to protect them too. Uh, we're going to say, you know, they provide these values and we're going to say you can't do certain things. Uh, some regulations and uh, town plans say, you know, you should do certain things or we'd prefer that you not do those things. That's not going to hold up in a development review uh, scenario and in court. Uh, you really have to be clear of what's allowed and what isn't. Um, and you also want to be as specific as possible about uh, quantifying those impacts and the length of a driveway or the percent of your developed area or conserved area, because that provides the developer and the community a clear expectation of what uh, this, these um, standards mean. It's not just, well, we'd like you to protect the forest block. Well, how much of it and uh, how, what does an impact mean? And, you know, can I do this versus that? Um, as we talked about earlier, it's important to make working lands viable and provide the flexibility for farms and forestry operations uh, that they need to be uh, to survive. Uh, so try to limit the amount of regulation that you put on that. You can't do certain things under state law, but uh, you know, a, requiring lo lot sizes to be large enough to participate in current use is really important because that's a great tax advantage for folks who are actively managing forests for both silviculture and uh, habitat, uh, enabling those accessory on-farm business uses to allow those farms to make money in other ways. Um, so those are really important too. Another thing I'll mention uh, is something called planned unit developments. It's a type of zoning uh, scheme that says, you know, we've got our basic zoning and our basic subdivision regulations, but we're going to allow some flexibility and some waivers in order to meet certain goals. This is outlined in statute and, and in your, it may be in a lot of your town zoning regulations, but um, it may not be as clear in those uh, standards and those, you know, procedures as to how flexible you can be, what the goals are and how you're going to reach them. Um, so instead of saying, you know, we're going to allow only three acre lots per uh, or three acres for each lot. We're going to allow you to do one acre lots and we're going to do and there are uh, smaller setbacks. Well, that's great as long as you are uh, doing it in a way that meets those conservation and open space preservation goals uh, and not just sort of giving free reign to a developer who might not want to meet those standards and finds it convenient to use the PUD requirements to uh, get out of them. Um, so really being clear in your regulations about what you, your community wants, regardless of how you do it with conventional or planning and development schemes is important because it doesn't provide predictability for anyone uh, if those regulations aren't clear. The other issue with PUDs in rural areas specifically is that they may allow for a type of um, development that's clustered and compact and preserves that open space. But if you've got a bunch of small clusters of housing scattered throughout your town, you're not going to achieve that compact development pattern on a larger scale that we're looking for. Um, so it can be useful in sort of that rural edge, you know, outside your uh, designated growth center, but maybe not in your forest area. Um, and it, it doesn't create a lot of housing. It doesn't really enable the growth that's going to draw things into the compact centers and away from your rural sprawl. The last thing is that uh, HOA managed open spaces resulting from a PUD, a planned unit development, typically break things up a lot in terms of different parcels. Uh, they don't have a clear management um, objective for that open space, and it ends up just being vacant. Not necessarily a bad thing, um, you know, because we do need some unmanaged wild areas, um, but uh, sometimes, you know, that can lead to 
not being able to use that space effectively, uh, and then pushing impacts somewhere else. Uh, the last recommendation I'll give you is to avoid duplicative protections. Uh, if there's a state permit that says this is a protected resource like a wetlands or stream buffers or uh, stormwater or agricultural soils, typically the state does a pretty good job of, uh, do, of regulating those things. Uh, and it can create complications and uh, confusion when a town regulation adds a layer on top of that. If there's a specific reason you want to protect class three wetlands or add an additional river buffer, um, that's great. But be clear about why you're doing that. Um, and it's typically easier to just say, if you've got a state permit, um, you know, if the state's reviewed this impact and they've allowed it or not allowed it, we're going to defer to that. Um, and another thing that's common, particularly in PUDs, is to subtract the area of uh, protected resource like wetlands or um, uh, river corridors or riparian buffers from the amount of developable area you can have on a lot. So saying you've got a 10 acre lot, half of that's wetlands, well then you can only develop half as much density in the area where you can, where those wetlands don't exist. You know, it's actually probably better to allow that developable area to maximize the amount of uh, development they can do uh, because you're ultimately just going to sort of export that impact outside of your uh, development area and it's going to end up in someone else's town or in your rural areas. Um, so allow that density where you want it uh, and don't make those extra rules that don't achieve your goals. Um, so that's it for zoning specifics. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, we covered a lot of details and uh, zoning is a really difficult uh, thing to do. It's complicated uh, and it sort of gets, you know, unwieldy over time. And a lot of what regional planning commissions are doing is trying to help towns update their zoning uh, to be a little more streamlined. Uh, an example of uh, how to do that is this enabling better places, a zoning guide for Vermont neighborhoods. A lot of the things we've talked about are in there in your planned growth areas. But if you're looking for uh, zoning tips for outside the planned growth areas and a really good guide for how that can work, check out the Community Strategies for Vermont's Forests and Wildlife, also a VNRC publication. Uh, it's a little older, but uh, the recommendations are still excellent and all those tools that are in there are still useful. Um, CCRPC also has a land use and climate change guide that talks about this a little more conceptually. You can share that with folks in your community to sort of convey the concepts. Um, Mapping Vermont's natural heritage is a good resource for sort of big picture planning for uh, Act 171 uh, and for forest conservation. Um, and if you're looking for opportunities to fund some studies or fund, uh, you know, compact development in your centers, our uh, funding opportunities database at the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission has some opportunities you can look at. Uh, the last recommendation is the Vermont Planning Information Center, which is going to be updated soon. It's a little out of date. Um, there's an implementation manual for uh, land use planning and sort of this, you know, basics of conservation and uh, zoning, uh, as well as compact centers. Um, with that, uh, I'll mention again, our regional land, uh, your regional planning commission can assist you. Uh, it may be a different one than CCRPC, um, but every town in Vermont is covered by a regional planning commission. Um, and there's a map on the uh, VAPTA, Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies website uh, that will show you who to contact for help. Uh, so with that, we got some time for questions. Great. There are plenty of questions, so we'll jump in. Um, uh, Joe had asked, I believe this was in response to the Marshfield example, um, that it sounded similar to a planned unit development, but without the density bonus. Joe, do you want to uh, come on and clarify your question real quick? Um, yeah, I, um, I guess it was more of a comment than a question, but I, it's something I've been thinking about. It's like, why don't we just require clustering in these rural areas? Right mm -hmm. when there's a subdivision, um, and I mean we don't because people re resist it. <laughs> I think, but but you know we we do have plan unit development in Huntington, and it has been used here, or there, here and there. But um, this idea of just requiring clustering, I think, is why not? You know, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, uh, definitely, if you can adopt a regulation that clearly says this is you know how we're going to do things. 
it's not optional uh, and it's based on good planning and good design, do it. That's the simplest way to get your goals met. Um, PUDs can still be useful when there's an unforeseen situation and it allows that flexibility, but it's got to be a fairly high standard of review and uh, the responsibility is on your community to sort of hold everyone to that standard and say, you know, we're not just going to give out a waiver for setbacks and lot size just because someone asks. We're really going to make sure that they're meeting those goals and demonstrating that they're meeting those goals. Right. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Good question. All right, so question from Julia. Um, how do you weigh the trade-offs between requiring higher open space requirements on individual parcels and encouraging more land-efficient development clustering? Uh, it's a good question. I sort of see them as one and the same. Um, you know, you can, but, but I guess you're talking about the strategy. You know, do you sort of go with requiring open space versus really encouraging that cluster development? Um, I think it's context sensitive and it's community sensitive, and it's also based on what you can administer. Requiring and and uh, reviewing uh, compact development takes a little bit of skill. It takes a little bit of time and attention. Um, so if you've got a community that has, um, you know, uh, planning commissioners and uh, development review board folks who are able to do that and feel like they've got the capacity, if you've got staff that can support uh, those decisions and sort of making sure that those standards are met, definitely go for that. Uh, and you can still require both. You can say, we're going to conserve open space and require compact development. Uh, but if you're sort of looking for a simple thing that everyone can agree on and is easy uh, standard to meet and, and show uh, without having to get into the complications of zoning and subdivision design, that you know open space requirement is still very useful. Um, and it can be pretty high uh, in your forested and conservation districts in your rural areas. Uh, I think most people, you know, you might hear some resistance to it in terms of this big number. Uh, but when you think about it and when you look at what's actually possible in a lot of our rural areas, the capacity just isn't there uh, to do anything more significant than, you know, 25% of a lot in development. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's a balance for sure. Great. Okay, so it looks like we have time for maybe one more question. My apologies that we won't be able to answer them all. Um, I'm going to try to grab one that is is most relevant uh, for Darren here. So next question from Andrew. Um, can zoning regulations reference Vermont conservation design maps of forest blocks in addition to static land use districts maps to account for updates and refinement? Um, I would not recommend doing that uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one, you know, if your uh, maps are going to change, it really should be adopted as part of your town plan so that everyone's on notice to say, hey, this is the latest and greatest. Um, it's based on some community feedback that we all agree this is what we're going to use. Um, and it is sort of been thought about in the context of other parts of your um, town plan and your sort of development pattern. Um, I would also say uh, you can use BioFinder maps to sort of guide how you're going to um, create those uh, areas in your town plan, your, your land use areas. Um, but it doesn't have to, you don't have to just adopt BioFinder. You might want to supplement that with natural resource inventories of your own. You might realize that, you know, gee, this forest block, you know, seems important, but uh, and it's also where we want to actually encourage some development in order to avoid impacts in the rest of the town. So um, you really do need to sort of go through BioFinder uh, with a little bit more attention to what's going to work for you. Um, in your town. Um, and there's also, you know, other reasons for having to go through that process because of our, our planning process requirements in Vermont. Um, but uh, I do encourage you to, you can, what you can do is reference any sort of um, maps or studies uh, that you have done at your local level, or even if you just want to reference these static biofinder maps, um, you don't have to you know, include all the details in your town plan. You can refer to some other studies uh, and keep the town plan shorter. But the other thing to remember is that town plans do get updated at least every eight years, but you can also amend them in that eight year time span. So if you realize the maps have changed a lot or we missed something, you can you know, fix that. Great. Well, thank you so much, Darren, and thank you, Jens. Uh, we're going to have to end there for time. So uh, please just note the contact information for both Darren and Jens. I know there are a few more questions. Um, you can send those questions out to, to Darren and Jens, and, and they'll be able to get back to you. Yeah, so, happy uh, to answer those questions anytime. 
Yeah. Thank, thank you all so much for being with us today. Darren, thank you. That was really excellent. I learned a lot. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Take care now.